for communities of opportunity. Um, communities of opportunity, as I think that most of you know, is an initiative that was catalyzed in 2014 by King County and Seattle Foundation. And then it's really focused on advancing equity in four areas, affordable housing, equitable development, um, health equity, uh, economic opportunity and community connections. And so um, one thing I want to say first is that we will be recording this workshop today. Again, we had a lot of people who wanted to attend, not all of whom can make this date. So uh, just know that, um, that it will be recorded. So you will be able to receive that recording later as well. Some logistics that I want to start with is to ask for folks to um, check your name on the Zoom in case, you know, make sure that it reflects how you would like to be referred to. Um, we'd love it if you share your organization and your pronouns as well, um, if you feel comfortable with that. And I am here to really support um, the trainers and all of you on this workshop today. Um, but I will not be the one leading it. Luckily, you'll get to hear from folks who are much more brilliant than I. Um, but with that, I would love to uh, note that there will also be an evaluation um, link that we'll post in the chat at the end of the workshop so that you can share feedback with us on this workshop. Um, we always want to make sure that we are following um, the input and guidance of community on what is most important to you. And it allows us to also make sure that we are able to provide more opportunities for learning uh, with and from one another, such as today's workshop. And so with that, I would love to pass it over to Shiho um, from the People's Economy Lab, who can then go on and help introduce the rest of um, the wonderful team that we have with us today. Shiho, can I pass it to you? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And actually, I'm going to pass it off to Jaguna because he's in charge of introductions. <laughs> thank you, Shiho. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining uh, People's Economy 101. We're really excited to have you here this morning and to share some great information with you and to hear from you and to interact with everyone on this call. And so um, the purpose of today's session um, is to explore the history of our current economic system and to understand what's contributing to what we call an extractive economy. We also wanna explore community-based strategies for building a regenerative economy um, and practices that are transformative, equitable, and create change in our system. Um, we wanna learn how the transition to practices and systems of production, consumption and distribution that are more cooperative, that are more democratic and resilient um, to our current forces of exploitation rooted in white supremacy and colonialism are functioning. And we want to, we will use the just transition framework to understand the current extractive economy and what is a regenerative economy. And the Just Transition Framework is a set of principles, processes, and practices that have been designed to advance a transition to a more regenerative economy. We'll also cover basic solidarity economics and some of the key topics around it, including money and finance, also work and labor. And we want to ground all the participants in an understanding of the economy as something that we all are actors in and something that we all create and something that we all can reshape. We also want to highlight examples both level and on a local level of BIPOC community leaders who are advancing new economic models that are driving change. And so that's what we're going to cover today, and we're excited to get started. Uh, my name is Jaguna Gishoro, and I'm a lab leader with the People's Economy Lab. Um, and I want to give my colleagues a few moments to introduce themselves, starting with Shiho. Hi, everyone again. I'm Shiho Fuyuki, also with the People's Economy Lab. I've been working with uh, Pell since the end of 2019, and it has been a really great opportunity for us to get connected uh, to the communities and all the inspiring work that these uh, community economic leaders are working on. And I'll pass it off to Derek. Hello, everyone. Uh, Derek Gruen uh, here with Jagoon and Shiho in the People's Economy Lab. Happy to be with you and look forward to entering into conversation with you today. 
right, thank you. And we'd also like to thank COO for this opportunity um, and for all the learning opportunities that have been provided for our local ecosystem. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge the historic work in this space of building a new, more regenerative and restorative economy, that there is a national and global movement around this work and that this isn't anything new, it's just information we're sharing today. So we want to acknowledge that, including the New Economy Coalition nationally and all kinds of other actors. Um, we also want to acknowledge the ancestors and indigenous people who have for millennia practiced regenerative economic systems and recognize that this is nothing new, but something we're just revisiting and remembering. Um, we also want to let you know that this will be recorded um, and that if you are not okay with this being recorded, um, that you please do not participate. Um, and we again encourage you to include your intros in the chat. Um, make sure we have the right name for you. We'd love to know what organization you're from, um, your preferred pronoun, um, and also would like you to include any preferred land acknowledgement or anything you'd like us to start with. All right, and so with that, I think I'll hand off um, to Derek to get the session started. Great, uh, thanks Jagoda and yeah, feel free to continue adding introductions in the chat. Um, so as, as Jagoda mentioned, we're gonna have a, a broad-based discussion today and um, give you some frameworks um, from folks like Movement Generation um, and others on a people's economy and the, and the broad interpretations of that. But we really wanted to start actually with you and um, your understanding. Before we get to a people's economy, we need to talk a little bit about um, what is economy? And so we'd ask you to just take a moment and uh, we're gonna enter into the chat here a, a link for some live polling to, to just, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the economy, what is the economy? So I'm gonna bring that up on the uh, screen um, and you can see the, uh, the link at the top, which is pollev.com slash deluxe door 903, randomly generated. Um, and take a moment to um, go to that site. We'll be using that um, polling location uh, throughout our meeting today. And um, the first questions are, oops, this is the wrong question here, but um, are what are, what is your understanding of the economy? So I'm gonna get us to the right question while you think about that and go to that location. Okay. So as folks start typing in, you will see them appear here. Um, it may take a moment to get oriented to the location. And, and while we're doing that, if anybody wants to unmute and kind of give a, a first take, you're welcome to do that as well. What do you think of when you think of the economy? Starting to get some results in power, money, people. Wealth, resources, exchange, consumption, production, And the, the larger words appear where they've been used more frequently, so you get a sense of kind of where folks are coming from. Government. So thanks for doing that. We'll we'll keep moving through as we uh, as we um, continue to explore this idea of what's the economy. I'm going to provide just a 
a basic framework from um, movement generation, just going back to the, the actual Greek origins of the word of, of eco, um, which comes from the word home, and from the word uh, nomi, which actually means management. So in the just transition framework, they talk about economy as a management of our home um, and how we manage our home and our resources. Um, in a popular understanding, you might hear more things like um, economy as money, um, as a, a system of production, consumption, and distribution. Um, you might hear about economic growth and the growth in production. And you might hear a lot about capitalism, um, which uh, solidarity economy uh, thinkers define as private ownership of production, wage labor, um, profit maximization, uh, and production for sale um, in market exchange. We're going to zoom out on the frame of economy a little bit more today from, from that understanding. And just wanted to provide a, a brief understanding of, of you know, a, a very short economic history to understand that the economy we live in today isn't the economy we've always lived in, nor is it the economy we will always live in the future. Um, so we've had hunter-gatherer economies that were subsistence-based. We have had agrarian economies that um, settled on the land to provide subsistence and started creating a surplus. Um, we've had feudalist economies um, and, and still do have a lot of all these economies today um, where land was um, owned in terms of a class basis um, where peasants um, farm to sustain and then provide surplus um, to the landholders. Um, we have capitalism where ownership is private, as we mentioned, where there's wage, labor, markets, and trade. We've had systems of socialism where there's more collective forms of ownership, uh, worker ownership and governance of capital and trade. Um, and we've had this idea, probably most recently, and the idea of neoliberalism and, and preventing or inhibiting any limits on capitalism and markets. And all these systems at some level are still alive and, and working today in different forms um, here in the United States and across the world. And we show this just to show there's a, a diversity of, of historic um, isms when it comes to the economy. And um, we believe we can kind of reinvent uh, the economy once again as we continue, that this is not a linear process by any means. So I'm gonna introduce Just Transitions framework um, around pillars of the economy. And this is to zoom out from kind of a narrow understanding of the economy as, as money or as profit to understand the, the key um, sources or elements of what makes up an economy in their framework. And it starts with resources. You know, the base of any economy is, is resources for production. But uh, to make an economy, you actually have to add work, um, human labor from those resources. And you do that for some purpose, some outcome. Um, often uh, less discussed, there's a worldview that guides the operation of this system of production. And underneath that is a system of governance, which enforces the system of resources plus work to some purpose. So that's just a, a very base understanding of to zoom out to what are some of the key pillars of economy we might want to think about when thinking about um, a people's economy. And it's also important to note that this process does not take place in a vacuum. Um, that the economy, uh, there is a hierarchy in terms of uh, we all need food to eat. Um, so there is no economy without farm workers. Um, if, if we don't have, uh, we're, if we're not growing food to eat, we can't uh, be building buildings and we can't all you know, sustain from there. So there is a, 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 a base to which our economy exists, which is um, a foundation, which is uh, rooted in um, you know, natural resources in our earth. You know, at, at the end of the day, all of our production comes from resources, which comes from our land, our water, our air. Um, so the diagram um, with the circle here is a, a, one attempt is called the, the donut from a woman named Kate Rayworth who was illustrating that, you know, there is a, 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 an ecological ceiling of which we can't exceed, uh, which is our, our natural environment. And there is also a, a social foundation, which we can't fall beneath, which um, all people have a right to in, in terms of both um, tangible things when you think about um, housing or energy or food and often less tangible things like political voice, um, like peace, um, like equity. So the, the economy does not exist without 
limits or boundaries which are guided by you know, human dignity and guided by the natural environment. Um, so I'm going to pause there and uh, hand over to Jagun, who's going to talk about the extractive economy. Thank you, Derek. Um, and as Derek mentioned, uh, the dominant economy is rooted in a history of conquest, colonialism, and classism. And that has created our modern system of global capitalism, um, which we call the extractive economy. And we're going to go through some of the pillars of that system um, that Derek described previously. Uh, next slide. And so first we're going to touch on the purpose. Um, the purpose of the extractive economy is the accumulation, concentration, and enclosure of wealth and power. The dominant narrative is that this is an evolution of previous economic systems and that the overall purpose is to serve for the good of humanity or of society. But in actuality, the purpose of an economy can be determined by its primary effect. And the primary effect of our current economic system is the enclosure of wealth and power rather than what is claimed by the dominant narrative. Um, next slide. Um, the economy, as Derek mentioned, is fueled by natural resources. And in the current system, that is those resources are acquired primarily through extraction. And ex through extraction of resources um, from the earth. And that frequently results in um, the forces of removal, such as result in pollution and other destructive um, phenomena on the planet. Um, next slide. Um, the next element is work. Specifically, human labor is um, the other component combined with resources. Um, work um, can be thought of as one of the key features um, that defines all living things. All life takes energy and converts it into power to do work. Um, as humans, when our work is in right relationship with the environment of the living world, um, then it is a renewable resources. But when that balance is obstructed, then it is not a renewable resource and then labor is subject to exploitation. In our current system, that is the approach to labor as a critical component of the entire extractive economy. And so the extractive economy primarily organizes human labor through coercion and exploitation. And that takes many forms. In the past, it's taken forms such as slavery and child labor, currently primarily wage labor. Um, next slide. Next, we'll talk about the overall, I'm so, oh, sorry, previous slide, the overall worldview. Um, the systems of production, consumption, and distribution are all, um, all sit on a foundation of several worldviews and paradigms that justify the systems of extraction and exploitation. Those include white supremacy, patriarchy, colonialism, individualism, and consumerism. Um, those forces are largely rooted in some of the historical um, events that we mentioned earlier. Next slide. Um, next is the governance component of the system. Militarism uh, is the defining feature of governance in this ex extractive economy. Um, well organized system in various forms is where courses can be extracted and labor can be exploited um, at a maximum and can be maintained continuously. Um, next slide. Um, next, we're going to watch a quick video um, that describes money and the general extractive economy um, to give you a brief overview. Derek, can you unmute your screen? You and me. Throughout human history, money in one form or another has helped societies to evolve through trade and innovation. In the last few hundred years, though, 
Money has gone from being a tool to being the centre, the very purpose of our collective life. And this has happened as we adopted capitalism as the global economic model. The number one rule of capitalism is that make more capital. The logic behind this rule is that capital makes all other things possible. With capital, which is just money and property in various forms, you can get food, housing, healthcare, a college education. Sounds good, right? The problem is, the way we make a lot of our capital is to extract value from the natural world and each other. We call this extraction value creation. And it works like this. You cut down a tree, make a chair, sell a chair in the market and collect value in the form of money. So you get the money and your customer gets a chair. But what does nature get? Now multiply that tree to a lost wood, a lost rainforest and an oil field many times over and it explains in part why we have climate change. We are turning so many natural resources into money. Our methods treat the people doing the hardest, most dangerous work as disposable units of production. In the interest of making ever increasing amounts of money, we are undermining the foundations of life. Most of the money made is going to a tiny number of people. Eight men now control as much wealth as the poorer half of the world's population combined. In other words, the majority of us are expected to spend our lives working to create money we will never see. We now live in a financialized world in which the power to create money is held by privately owned multinational banks, in which the needs of the earth that sustains us are treated as barriers to the infinite growth of our stocks of capital, in which the economic rules push more and more money upwards away from the majority. So money is no longer about you and me. If you think we should treat money as a tool, not a god. If you believe that the logic of the future should instead be about you and me and everybody. If you believe the most sacred value should be afforded not to money, but to life, then the chances are you don't agree with capitalism. And my friend, you are not alone. Evidence from around the world suggests that there are now millions, if not billions, of us feeling the same way. We can build new systems to replace this dying one. We can reclaim the future. We can change the rules. Money used to be. Right. And so that was a powerful piece about the extractive economy. And so we want to sort of gather your reflections about that um, by asking another question in the live poll. Um, the question is, what elements of the extractive economy show up most in your work? Um, we know that most folks on the call are doing or involved in community development work that addresses some of the most critical uh, barriers and injustices in our economy. So we want to know how does that extractive economy show up in your work and what motivates you to show up on this call? And so would love to get your reflections into that full question. And so on the screen, we can see our responses. We see wages, income, disinvestment. And equality. Nonprofit sector. Exploitation is very large. Financial deadlines. Thank you for great responses. Overwork, poverty, banks, dependence, resources. Thank you. These are some great responses. All right. So it looks like folks have been able to give some great responses. Um, we encourage you to continue. Um, but I will pause here and pass it pass it off. Um, so I believe Derek to take on the next section. Great. And we're not going to leave you in a pessimistic place. <laughs> we know it's, we know you already know the extractive economy too well. Um, right. And, um, and the purpose of this workshop, though, is, is, is to know when we're, 
moving away from that extractive economy towards something different. So um, fortunately, we're going to lift the mood here and talk about how we go from that extractive economy uh, to a people's economy. Um, so before we move on, it looks like we have a question from Aaron Johnson. Go ahead, Aaron. Do you want to unmute yourself or chat in your question? Yes, uh, I wanted to just interject to say at the heart of this, there is something very important that I was expecting to, to see during this presentation. And sometimes this is a question of uh, life and death. And this is where we all convert. I wanted to hear the word tax. And I didn't hear this within the presentation. And I think that is, a, that is so important because <laughs> we always hear about taxes. Anything we do, whatever we buy, tax is always involved. And uh, even in the field health system, they always collected some percentage of whatever they had to pay to somebody or after paying them, they had to collect that. And if that is not collected, to some system even when a person was dead, he was still beaten or they will still put it on the children who have to come back. And this is exactly what also makes some people poor in our society because some people claim to pay more taxes. That's why they have to have more benefit and more um, treatment of human being. So I wanted to hear something related to tax as well. And apart from that, I wanted also if you could, uh, uh, within this dimension, because we spoke about the word, word view, but to link it also in the internal economy, because they have a lot of pressure to call so that you know how to justify the economy. I just wanted to, to have that, if you could think of that as well. Yeah, thank you for elevating that. I think, you know, in this, idea of an economy and kind of thinking about what's what's the line between extractive, for example, taxation system to one that's redistributive and trying to figure out um, the best way to, to balance the need for public investment, um, but that's not on the backs of, of people who can't actually pay. So thanks for re raising that as kind of a, a borderline question of extractive or um, economy. And um, so we're going to just briefly introduce the people's economy and we'll get to then some deeper opportunity for conversation and uh, looking in, in particular through looking at some examples of, of local work um, that's happening today and addressing these questions. Um, did you want to jump in, Jigunuri? Okay. So for people's economy, you know, we can talk about it in, in many names. Um, you, you might have heard about solidarity economy, a new economy, well-being, um, community-centered economy is a term we use. All these words may have slightly different meanings, but what we're trying to show is there are, are a diversity of approaches. There are many paths to what we're hoping to get at, which is um, a, really a healthy economy that's about life. Um, and that does not, um, that breaks from the, the past of an extractive system. So um, in thinking about now moving forward in the just transition framework um, on these same pillars of the economy, um, the, uh, the idea is that, you know, when we think about a purpose of the economy, we really, we really start with that. And we think about uh, the well-being of people as really the center, as well as uh, the ecology we live in um, and starting to move away from an economy that's um, based on enclosure and accumulation. Uh, this is what, what, what movement generation calls the living economy. Um, and that starts with thinking about a more regenerative uh, approach to using resources um, that is made uh, rooted in extraction and displacement um, forms of, of production and work that are more cooperative among uh, the people doing the work. Uh, it will require a fundamental change in our worldview um, towards really holding uh, care um, and sacredness um, for each other and for our resources. Um, and it will take deep participation um, from everyone uh, to actually be able to govern the system without um, violence as the tool to enforce uh, economic 
uh, structures. So this is the uh, the movement generations framework for a, a living economy. And I just wanted to point out, in addition to that, um, we we need to be moving beyond the framework of just um, the economy as a whole to understanding um, how people are doing um, within that and how groups are disproportionately benefiting or impacted. Again, I bring up this donut to show kind of that universal framework of, you know, we all need to achieve a, a base level of, of well-being um, through our economy and we need to stay within our ecological limits. Um, but in addition to that, we also need to be uh, using this idea of targeted universalism and I've got John Powell's photo up here, which is that we need to be paying special attention to who actually is not uh, achieving um, that level of health, for example, or of um, political voice and be intentional in crafting an economy that is um, targeted to the, the groups that are falling below the base threshold of dignity on, on this social foundation. Uh, the overall idea of the just transition framework is we need to make this transition from an extractive economy to a living economy and that um, we all live in both. Um, so we need to navigate the contradictions of all of us needing to uh, feed our families in what is fundamentally extractive economy. And we all are participants in extractive economy. And, and also we need to be pushing ourselves towards that more living economy structure. So it's not about a, a, a blame game or, or any of this, or there's no perfect here. We're all navigating the contradictions of living in the system we live in. And the, bringing the broader framework of just transition together, you can see the idea of moving from this extractive economy to a living economy. And movement generation um, identifies a few key strategies um, that are simple ideas. First, we need to stop the bad, and then we need to build the new. So we need to stop the harm as we're building the new systems that are more regenerative. We need to divest from the power that is supporting extraction while we reinvest in the power of communities to um, meet their own needs. And we do that through a filter of values that we hold close. And each community might have slightly different um, variations on these values, uh, but the values are a critical part of this process. And while we're doing this, we're drawing down power from um, the global um, to the local level and to more community uh, self-determination. So this is a, a big picture of the Just Transition Framework. We'll put in a chat a link to a more complete uh, zine, kind of animated um, guide to the Just Transition Framework as you'd like to go deep so you can explore that more. I'm sure many of you are also already familiar with this framework, so you might have a lot to add. Um, for the rest of our, our workshop, we're really gonna focus on this element of building the new. As, as a place that's often um, neglected in all of the work that's needed to really stop the harm. But we, we wanted to really focus on that so we can explore the, the work that is underway to build these new models of how an economy can work towards goal being. Uh, another way to look at this is, you know, what we really need versus kind of this extractive economy false hope. And, and in, in this process, we need to be paying attention to um, where we're falling. Uh, in the middle of this is the idea of like, what is politically realistic? Um, but we know we cannot only work in what's politically realistic. So uh, it, what we can do is actually create the things we really need right now, even if they don't fall in the realm of what's considered mainstream or politically realistic. We can work to make, to codify or make real the things uh, or make law even the things that are politically realistic that are what we really need. We can expose the things that are actually leading us towards the wrong, the wrong path that are false hopes, but have political power. And then we can expose those false hopes for what they really are. Um, so this is just another way of looking at that. And the ultimate project is, is movement, is to govern towards, to move what's politically realistic towards the direction of what we really need. This is the uh, three circles framework. One final piece here is just um, to consider what each of our role is in this process. And we each may have different roles. And this um, framework by Deborah Fries, the, 
there are basically two loops. There's this old model, this extractive economy that is, um, has risen up but is slowly dying. And there, there's a new economy or the people's economy, which is slowly rising. And in the old economy, there are people that are working to protect um, the people most vulnerable from the system. And, and there are people hospicing that old system from in its death. And on the other side, there are people who are actually building the new economy um, right now. And to make it the connection, people who are illuminating that we don't have to stay in this old system. In fact, it's dying and we need to start building the new one that we need. So we're gonna take another breath here and actually do another poll. Um, and, and like to just ask you what role that you see yourself um, playing in a just transition? Um, do you see yourself in one of those categories, for example, or do you have an idea that uh, is something completely different of how you see your own role in uh, the just transition. So we'll go back to our, um, our uh, poll here and I'm gonna share screen so you can see what you are saying. And if anyone wants to jump in with a verbal response, you're more, more than welcome. We just know there's a lot of people, so it's a way to give opportunity. I'll just refresh here. I think it's not actually, there we go. So healing work, inner healing work, um, feeding, nurturing, and building local power toward the new. Uh, I'm an illuminator. I'm building the new a connector. My role is narrative shift more illuminating advocate. Change maker. I think part of the idea here is to acknowledge that uh, there are, there's important work in all of these spaces. Um, whether you are a person uh, working within the old system, um, helping protect people or whether you're um, building new economic models or or telling the story um, we need all roles so thank you for taking a moment to think about that um I encourage you to keep adding and we'll um leave these up and return to them at the end so folks can see them so for our next piece here i think we're gonna um transition over uh, to Jaguna, who's gonna talk about how this work really plays out in practice. Um, and I'll bring up the slide here for you, Jaguna. Here. And so locally, the People's Economy Lab focuses on supporting the leaders, initiatives, and um, systems that advance building a new economy locally. And one of the programs through which we do this is our New Economy Washington Frontline Community Fellows Program. And this is a program that provides financial support um, as well as projects and peer learning for frontline community leaders from BIPOC communities who are advancing projects that create those new models. 
um, that create greater empowerment and well-being in our communities. And so we have um, five amazing fellows currently in our first cohort, along with four peer learners who really represent the amazing work that's going on in our community. Um, those include Lata Ahmed of the Drivers Union, which is a local ride-sharing gig workers union that fights for worker protections, including $15 an hour for gig workers, and also operates um, mutual aid and mutual support systems for gig workers and is really advancing um, empowerment for gig workers in our economy. We also have Chiarpa Matheson, who is launching a native real estate development fund um, for local native communities to reclaim ancestral land they don't currently have control of. Um, we also have Ariel Banks of Plant Based Food Share, which is a local COVID response plant based healthy food share program that is developed into a local food ecosystem and human capital development program that is creating new ways for folks that are in need of food to become producers of food for their community. We also have Asia Tale of Yahao, which is an indigenous artist collective, which develops income generating opportunities and eco economic development opportunities for collectives of native artists so that they can greater have greater access to economic advancement and growth while working together collectively. They also work to advance mutual aid among native artists and to use their art and their cultural capital to support other communities of color, including the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we also have Kamo Patel, who is an amazing design engineer locally, working on community development projects like the Connective that are connecting small businesses and communities of color, or looking to connect those small businesses to contracting opportunities with um, large stakeholders in government and other institutions. We also have Mark Jones of Community Owned Resource Development, which is a local collective of BIPOC community leaders primarily rooted in the South Seattle area who are developing um, systems and frameworks for community members to invest in community rooted development projects and for community members to build beloved community as a basis for new economic models that are owned and advanced by those community members. We also have Analia Bertoni, who is the director of Via Comunitaria um, and is running the Salsa de la Vida Farming Cooperative Project. And this is a project uh, to build a farming cooperative owned and run by um, Latino women that are part of Via Comunitaria, who have, um, have skills in farming and who have experienced um, the effects of the extractive economy in um, driving them to immigrate to the United States and also fa um, facing them with gentrification and displacement in the South Park area. Via Communitaria is launching this farming cooperative to create um, a collectively owned economic engine for those women um, through which they create an economic vehicle and they train and develop themselves and build their community. We also have um, Lizzie Baskerville and Joycelyn Chui, who are part of a project rooted in the International District Chinatown area that's looking to develop a community composting operation that would serve and um, be owned by restaurants and businesses in the International District. Um, it's a great project that's looking at innovative ways to use waste to generate um, resources and greater wealth for those local businesses. And so those are some of the great projects that we're supporting through the fellowship program. Next slide. And so as we look at all of these projects, um, they all align with the value system that the People's Economy Lab has identified. Um, these are projects that align with these values and that support the just transition to a more regenerative economy. Some of those values are local needs, that they focus on the needs of the local communities and are rooted in them. Um, resilience, um, that they cultivate a diverse, strong internal economy in our communities, that equity is prioritized, particularly racial equity. Um, stewardship and collaboration being approaches that are primary to these projects. Next, integrity in terms of the way that they deliver their projects and their integrity to the community's control and interests and relationships. That um, we all 
organizations and projects that are deeply rooted in relationships with community um, and that are also um, honored and valued by community. Next slide. And so some of the characteristics that these share these projects share in practice um, in different areas are that are the area of say worker cooperatives um, in terms of production and reproduction. Um, there is a lot of um, do it yourself self direction and provisioning. We see care work manifesting work like plant based food share that's primary focused on caring for community, but also focused on generating that economic system. We're seeing community gardens, skill shares, um, community productions and repair cafes, among other things. Um, in practice, we're seeing um, systems of distribution and exchange created by community that includes social currencies um, communities are creating the, our own fair trade systems. Communities are sharing tools and creating economies based on gifting and not just money. These are some of the new that community is building. In terms of consumption, we're seeing community land trusts um, locally, like Africa Town Community Land Trust and others, um, where the consumption and ownership is moving towards a more communal form. We're seeing food cooperatives and resident owned communities with concepts um, like community owned real resource development. On the finance side, these sort of new models sometimes look like credit unions, sometimes it's peer lending. We see a lot of community loan and capital funds. Um, sometimes it's direct public offerings. Um, and then we see public banks, even in other states where there are public institutions owned by the government that have a purpose to serve community. In terms of governance, um, we're seeing things in the local level like participatory budgeting at the city council level. Um, we're seeing community governance um, in different areas like South Park, Skyway and other areas. Um, and we're seeing governance in public sector and schools starting to reflect more democratic principles and also seeing more progressive taxation. Um, next slide. And so some of the defining characteristics that we see in the projects locally and in the broader new economy uh, are that these major components of power, decision-making and ownership of production are, in the, are better distributed and more democratically distributed. Um, and then the consumption and distribution is also in the hands of workers and communities and is more democratic. Um, we also see that the purpose and scale of production is not simply to enclose wealth and power to maximize profit, but is to meet the needs of people in place. Uh, next slide. And so um, we're going to show you a short video clip of the Boston Ujima project, which is a project on the East Coast, which sort of typifies um, a community based approach to a regenerative economy. Two hundred people from our communities, from Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan and Jamaica Plain, from Boston's communities of color, came together in this wild experiment. Who in this room is planning to make a loan to support the business today? Can you please raise your hand? Motor bicycle A. B, Madonna Wholesale, C, Fresh Fruit Generation, B, Normus Catering, E, Sydney, Lady Design. The summer was an amazing event. We raised $10,000 in three days. 200 people from across the communities came together to decide what to do with that money. Five businesses from our communities pitched their ideas and talked about not just why they were good business investments, but also what they were doing already to support the, the growth and the well-being of our community. My plan is to have my own restaurant so people in the community can go and enjoy food and relax and have a good time. We are a youth employer. We do whatever the people ask us to do. We see uh, 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 Ujima is trying to create something new, a grand community dream and experiment that helps us answer the question, um, what would a people's economy look like if we designed it and created it and nurtured it um, ourselves? Like a lot of people, particularly Black people from the inner city, I was not thrilled about the prospect of the 
engaging with traditional banking and traditional lending, so I did not do it. Finding out about the efforts of community members like me to leverage pooled lending sources to take a bit of the fear and the anxiety and hesitance away from lending, period, and actually engage people of color with good ideas and get money into their pockets in a way that's palatable and that we can actually get with. Uh, I was so on board. Ujima is not only filling the gap where the conventional market's dollars wouldn't go, they're going way, way beyond it. To have a democratic economy means that the control and the direction of our dollars shifts from the 1% into the hands of the 99%. I don't live in some fortress on a hill. I live right here. If I'm not doing everything possible that I can to uplift and engage youth and formerly homeless people and incarcerated folks and marginalized people who are generally shut out of the economy, I feel like I'm not doing my job as a community organizer or an entrepreneur. When you're in the zone of, of what if, you know, imagining what's possible and then actually getting a chance to do something tangible to realize your goals. There's something about that that's, um, that's life-giving. Right, and I think a lot of you are already familiar with Boston Ujima Project, but I think that great, give a great example of how that community is implementing a new way of operating and managing home. And so we wanna go from that video into um, another poll question. Um, as you reflect on that, what elements of people of people's economy are you working towards? And again, a people's economy or a regenerative economy are you working towards? Maybe similarly to Boston Ujima Project or something else we've mentioned, or maybe a, some work that reflects the values and some of those elements that we touched on. All right, we're seeing local care, self-sufficiency, shifting community, making, decision, shifting is big, right? Affordable, credit. I see housing, power groups, circularity, community centered. Resources, accessibility, power. All right, thank you everybody for those great shares. Please continue, decision power, collaboration. All right, well, thank you everybody for sharing those. And so with that, I'll pause and pass it off. Great. Thank you, Chaguna, and thank you, Derek, for a great um, education and learning about extractive economy, people's economy, and how we transition. Uh, we want to highlight uh, for you today local examples in the greater Seattle area of a people's economy. Um, we you know, as you've shared in the in the poll, we know you're all working on working towards this also, but we wanted to make sure to be able to highlight a couple of examples from our uh, New Economy Washington uh, Frontline uh, Community Fellows Program. Uh, this, as Jaguna mentioned earlier, we were able to select five fellows 
And of the five, we're gonna highlight two, and they are Analia Bertoni, Executive Director of Villa Communitaria, and Mark Jones of Beloved Communities and CORD. Uh, and so with that, uh, we've asked them to uh, prepare and share about 10 minutes each about their project and um, how they're working from, uh, they're working toward a living economy, toward a people's economy. I'm gonna ask Analia to go ahead and share first, uh, but before you share Analia, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how, uh, your, uh, how you've come to the Villa Communitaria. Oh, thank you, Shiho. And I, I really appreciate the COO to put together this amazing space for people to come together and learn together. Um, I am also very thankful to the People's Economy Lab for choosing our organization to be part of this cohort. And um, I, I don't know what else she had to, to, to share. <laughs> yeah, but thank, thank you, you for bringing me here. There's a way that I can share my screen. Let me see. Yes. Okay. If you can see it. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, uh, thank you again. Um, the project, uh, the pilot project that I'm going to present today is called Salsa de la Vida. Um, this is a saying in Spanish that means like uh, the spice of life. Um, let's see if I can move this down. Um, Villa Comunitaria cultivate leaders to create a stronger community, and we envision a community where all families can thrive and participate. Our programs offer his, a, a holistic approach to families that mostly are immigrant families uh, in Seattle and South King County. And the programs are systems, navigation and human resources, economic development and financial literacy, skills and leadership development, healthy community and citizenship, both education and community engagement. Under the umbrella of the economic development is uh, where we have Salsa de la Vida. The, this group started in 2018 uh, to learn, they started in a way to learn and explore the op opportunity to food access and food justice issues. This is a core um, group of five community members that are growing uh, organic vegetables at Mara Farm, and that this is a land that belongs to parks and recreation. And we have, a, this piece of land is called market land and we can use it to to produce and also could be to sell um, as i said the produce harvested in here is sold to individuals enrolled in the csa produce boxes uh, and we share the the excess on last year in 2020 they incorporated medicinal herbs to the business model we also um, offer to this group and the larger community, technology classes, English classes in partnership with Highland Community College and leadership development. And I would like to uh, share with you what is extractive economy and the impact of immigrants um, in general. And, and this is just my, my view. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to do this um, um, a lecture, but I think is what is going on with the economy of some of the South American, rest of America country that is not the US. Uh, most of the problems or issues start with globalization, where uh, we see a predatory use of natural resources to create the value to products and to bring these products to developed countries. Um, the impact of, in the local economy uh, is a drop of prices of produce, 
and uh, people have to migrate to big cities. And then when they don't find their um, needs fulfilled, they mm, see be forced to come to US. Um, I am from Argentina and I can define myself in economic displace in this country. When people come to US, they become low pay workers. They have no benefits uh, of social security of health insurance. Uh, they are victims of predatory rent and credit. They are subject to wage theft and scam. Uh, mostly living in poor condition buildings and uh, what is going on, particularly in our immigrants in South Park, in South Park, they are experiencing displacement. Um, and how we want to solve this problem? The condition of immigrants, women, low income, and some of them, English is the third language, um, because most of them, some of them speak a dialect. Um, I, want, I would like to share with you that uh, the situation of them were uh, uh, leaving their countries because of the constraint of the economy, as I explained before. Uh, these women came from Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Uh, most of them are renting in the same place for the last 20 years. It's, if you know South Park and the old buildings that are around, uh, we have um, uh, buildings that are in not good conditions, but this is in some way good for them because they are still paying low rent. Uh, we can define them as a vulnerable, vulnerable population because they live in this corridor of the Cloverdale Street. Um, the women that participate in this project are at home moms, hard, very hard worker women that support their husbands and sons and daughters that work in construction, kitchen aid and landscaping. And in short, the problem that we want to solve in here is to close the technical skills, advocacy and economic gap and provide advancement and opportunities. Um, the economic opportunity uh, that we see moving forward is um, creating a solution um, with a sustainable model of cooperative with, as I said before, with these amazing entrepreneurs that, that will be the owners and managers of their own business. Uh, this is a pilot that will invest in local uh, capital and using local resources. Uh, we want to, we continue generating jobs uh, for seven people in this particular project. We are hiring, we have seven people working in this. And uh, we want, we are creating the moment to start the business and support the integration of these people to the economy. Um, as support, we provide administration and also referrals and coordination. Our long um, and short term out outcomes are listed in here. Um, thank you to the, uh, some of the funding providing by the People's Economy Lab. We were able to build and raise uh, the beds, uh, improve the irrigation in the farm, um, continue access to fresh, local, and organic produce, add value to farming in the way of, of this uh, model of business to the CSA boxes that we sell, and medicinal kits. Um, we create and, and manage a membership. Last year, we have only 14 people. We want to expand to 70 when we combine CSA and medicinal kits. Um, we continue learning about the business of cooperative, uh, have access to technology, technology classes, and laptop. As I said before, we provided the laptops for these women to take at home and continue being participating in workshops and conversations with the team. Um, 
the good thing about uh, what that, that is going on this year is access to cooperative training. We make a partnership with the Northwest Cooperative uh, Development Center that is providing uh, workshops. Uh, with these workshops, we are creating the mission and vision, the budgeting, uh, talking about decision making and how we move forward, and also about uh, marketing strategies. In the long term, we want to increase the economy in these families that we serve. We want to continue investing in the farm. And uh, uh, this project that is the Salsa de la Vida will move to create a sustainable cooperative model. If we are able to finish this year with this model, Villa Comunitaria will like to move to support an association of construction workers or janitors, because I think this is the right model to improve the economy in this uh, very bad economy that we have today. Well, I really appreciate the, your time. And this is my phone number. This is my email. If you want to reach out, we'll be very happy to uh, share more information about our pilot project. Thank you, Analia. What a great inspirational story of the work you're doing in South Park. Um, I think a couple of things that you've highlight, highlighted that go back to the elements that we heard in a regenerative economy, a people's economy was around the decision making and ownership of production, consumption and distribution. And I think cooperatives are a great model of, of exactly that. So thank you for showcasing the work and Really, um, it's a pleasure to work with you through the fellowship and also the steering committee of People's Economy Lab. Um, I would like to open it up to folks um, before we jump to Mark, if anyone has questions uh, for Analia. And, and if not now, you can have some time to think about it and we'll have um, time at the end for Q&A, but I uh, want to make sure to address any questions that's coming up for you, specifically for Analia, um, if there are any. Hi, um, this is Tita with the Khmer community um, of Seattle King County, and I really appreciate um, you bringing up that model, Analia, because it's empowering the people, right? It's empowering the family. You know, they feel confident in doing what they know and, and using the land. And, and, and I, you know, that's, it's a connection, right? You know, connection with, with the land as well as, you know, improving their own living and, and empowering them. I think that's, um, yes, that's, um, and, and that's, and that's what connect us together and, 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 and having to uh, to build, um, giving them that opportunity where they don't otherwise would have it, you know, going through the system. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, thank you. I, and 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 I, you know, we want to um, doing the same thing for the Kamar community as well because we have many vulnerable families and you know in low and paying job and being displaced uh, in the white center area so we're neighbors to south park and <laughs> and so um so yeah so we're hoping to do that you know for our own community as well so and i've been to mayor's farm um just a couple weeks ago i think they have an event mm -hmm. there beautiful yeah so um love to see the chickens and yeah <laughs> Well, thank you for your words, and we are open to, you know, share any information and best practices and collaborate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because Khmer, I don't know if you know, so Cambodian, you know, Cambodia, Khmer um, community, where, you know, um, majority is agricultural, right, our country. And so lots of, um, especially our elders, they really want to, um, you know, show uh, and teach the, the younger generation, you know, about farming, you know, uh, how to grow, you know, herbs and um, those um, uh, vegetables, uh, you know, from our homeland. So that's, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, 
We hope in the second session, uh, which is coming up in April 21st, we'll have breakouts to talk about each other's projects. And I think that'll be a great opportunity uh, to learn about everyone's projects on the call and really share resources, best practices, and uh, insights with each other. Um, I'd like to move on to Mark Jones of CORD uh, and Beloved Communities, uh, community-owned resource development. Um, and ask him uh, to share about your work. Um, and before you dive in, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and what, what brings you to CORD. Okay, good afternoon, or I, I think it's still morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Jones. Uh, I come to this work through um, a series of threads that I was working on for many years. Um, so I've got about 45 years of experience as a senior executive leader and a consultant, and about 35 years doing entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial leadership and organizational development, uh, high performance team development, um, performance optimization, transformative technology, international negotiations, and, and DEI and social cast research and interventions. And I also have come from a background of doing a lot of education and training, uh, coaching in the academic world, uh, community, uh, individual teaming, and actually in sports contexts. So what it, these threads have come together for me, and I'm going to uh, share my screen here. So you get to see what I see. <laughs> so there's, I have a partner in this work. We met about four or five years ago. Um, I'm going to out him even though he's not going to like it. He's on this call, it's Curtis Brown. And I've been working on building beloved communities and trying to get a community, a direct community impact, direct community um, participation. And we met. And Curtis started talking about the economics of how all this works. And I had been leaning into the, um, the mechanisms and the relationships that are required. And so this, this is kind of a partnership of looking at the technical aspects of things and really leaning into what are the relationships that are required. So CORD, as you had mentioned, is a community-owned resource development. And what we focus on is a term from beloved community, and I'll end with defining that, but I won't define it right now. So we're, we're looking for you know, really self-sustaining high-performance teams. Now, those self-sustaining high-performance teams happen to be self-sustaining high-performance communities, right? So what we are paying attention to is making sure that people play well together, that they know how to play well together. Um, some of the issues that I've encountered in, in other parts of this work were that within BIPOC communities and among BIPOC communities, we didn't always play well together. And so that's, that's a part of it. And then there's some structural aspects of how how to achieve funding, how to get funding, how to spend funding correctly, you know, leading to long-term multi-generational beloved community. So what we're going after is we've been working with, right now it's about a team, an overall team of around 40 um, Southeast Seattle uh, organizational leaders and then a sub team that, that is focusing right now on pulling together the, the first implementations, the first prototypes of some of our core things. So you know, what we're looking for is intact, uh, self-sustaining neighborhoods, um, 
we're looking for that to be community owned, right? Communally owned. Um, my endeavors in the entrepreneurial world have suggested that most of the outcomes from entrepreneurs end up being self-serving to the entrepreneur. And it's very difficult to change those mindsets for to be, no, we are doing this together. We are owning together. Uh, ultimately, you know, the, the two parts of this are around you know, where people live, where people work, the work they do, and sustainability you know, of the ecology. So that's the, um, the, that's the, the new economy that is not extractive. That's how I'll say it. So I think I've gone through kind of the things we do around education. Um, we are leaning into right now, really trying to understand how the funding mechanisms need to work. And uh, people's economy has been leaning in really heavily with us on this. Um, if we can't bring in, um, if we can't get the interest, which we have now gotten, of where money lives, then you know this system becomes an exercise. So we spend a lot of time working with different types of investors with their different motivations, trying to actually get them to recognize that what they're doing is an extractive economy, which is a zero sum game. That game will end because there can only be one, right? Uh, the overarching problem, the bigger problem, is that you know the extractive economy means that there aren't very many winners, <laughs> and there are a lot of losers. And so we focused on Southeast Seattle because that is a zone that first kind of existed due to gentrification, and now continues to function due to gentrification, but it's also being broken apart. And those folks are heading off to Skyway, right? They're heading off to Renton, they're heading off to Kent. And, and with that, that means we're actually losing communities. And as uh, Jagun and Derek explained, you know, the way, the way we characterize it is that um, the extractive economy you know, is, it has these two pieces of it. You know, it's an excess of capital that gets centralized um, and it's a consumption base. And at least from a BIPOC perspective, most of us BIPOC living in the US are in the economy too, we are consumers. And you cannot accrue if you're constantly consuming. So we've started with where we are, right? We've started with people that, that we're already meeting and saying, we got to stop this. And so, you know, cord with cord, we brought in some ideas and we said, you know, if we learn to play well together, then these structural things become possible. It becomes possible and probable together that we can't do alone. It's kind of been one of our things. So we are definitely trying to change the economic patterns and dynamics. We pay attention, we use the term commons a lot. Um, some, a lot of times commons is just thought of as a piece of property, right? That we go, no, the commons is about relationships, it's about how we interact, how we interact together. Then it's about natural resources. And then it's about converting those assets and it's about self-sustaining asset investment. And that, that last part cannot occur until we get the first parts in line. Who benefits? I think I've talked about that, but there is an interesting way that this plays out when we start leaning into working with, you know, different funding sources. We're going, huh, okay, the people that 
should be owning this are considered and are called non-sophisticated investors, which basically means that in an extractive economy, they really don't have a role at the table. We are switching that out. You know, part of our education and training is to make sure that that our our, our communities, our people know the game and can navigate navigate the processes. So, you know, what we're what we're doing is we're building these personal relationships so that the people can build their businesses out and they have a place to do it. And you know, one of the trickier parts is what happens when you are building your business out, you know, and it's different than where you are putting your re real estate investment. But those are the types of things that we're doing. Um, by the end of this year, we should have some prototype funds going. Uh, on our core team right now, we have um, black developers, black architects, black da -da -da -da, on and on and on. Um, and and we're, we're using that to showcase this is how the game can be played. That's it. <laughs> well, that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for sharing uh, the work of CORD. And uh, back to the elements that um, that uh, we learned earlier with just transition, I think what we're seeing through CORD uh, is uh, really about democratizing wealth, uh, shifting ownership to you know, you may call it unsophisticated investors, but we've always wanted to be investors. We've never had the opportunity <laughs> to. And so this is really centering uh, racial equity, social justice. And now this is going to give us an opportunity to be able to do that. So thank you for spearheading that work. Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, this is one of our last two polls, and I know we only have three minutes left. Uh, what values and practices do you see coming through from um, these projects that you just heard about toward a people's economy? So Derek, if you can pull that up, um, would love to get some feedback from some of you. And also, uh, again, we only have three minutes, but if anyone has questions for Mark, uh, and and the work that he's doing, um, please feel free to unmute and ask a question. And if I put you to sleep, sorry. Not at all. I think we're all wide awake. Well, if we don't have questions, uh, Derek, are you able to share your screen? Are there polls coming in? Awesome. So what values and practices do you see coming through from these projects toward a people's economy? Equity at the center, ownership, empowerment, access, collaboration, relationships, cooperation, cooperative. It's moving too fast for me. Well-being, <laughs> empowerment and connection. Thank you, Erin. Um, target, targeted universalism. These are really great. Um, thank you. And, and before we wrap up, one final question. Um, what are your next steps to moving toward a people's economy? Thank you, Ty, access and collaboration. So one last question for us, um, what are your next steps down toward a people's economy? I love the action, connecting with cord. That's a great next step. Or it is connectable. Focus on material material economies. Thank you, Como. Relationship building. Absolutely. Add value. 
Great. As we wrap up, I am reminded of one thing that Aaron Tanaka mentioned when we brought him out uh, to talk with us back in now, I think 2018. He said um, to funders to please resource the ability for communities to learn together. So I want to thank COO uh, for giving us this opportunity to learn together uh, and, um, and to continuing to support our learning journey. Um, Jaguna, I think you were going to close us out. Yes. Um, thank you, Shio, and thank you everybody for attending People's Economy today. Um, we are hosting the next session on April 21st at 1 p.m., and we hope you'll attend that as well. Um, that'll be a more interactive session where we'll, we'll continue to talk about these issues, but we'll engage more um, in a discussion. And so moving forward, um, we would love for you to engage us with any questions or comments that you have about this session or about this work in general. The People's Economy Lab would love to be a resource for you and for other members of the local ecosystem that are looking to advance towards a more just and regenerative economy. And so you'll see our contact information on screen. Um, please reach out to us with any questions or comments. And if you'd like to reach out to Mark or to Analia about their projects um, and don't have their contact information, please reach out to us and we can make those connections um, and we look forward to it. Um, thank you again for your attendance and for your amazing work. And we greatly appreciate COO for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I know we're at time, so I just want to chime in and give my deep gratitude and thanks to Jaguna, to Derek, to Shiho, to Mark, and to Analia for leading us through this really powerful workshop today. Um, it was amazing to hear not only all of the frameworks and incredible stories of just um, resilience and inspiration and creativity and commitment to building a truly equitable and just and transformative um, economy and to know that there's so much work going on in our community, all of the people who are on this call today, who are part of that. And so my deep gratitude to you. So excited for the second workshop on the 21st. Um, and also a plug to please fill out the very brief survey when you can, because we want to keep on offering workshops like these. Um, and I know some folks might not be able to make it on the 21st. So we also want to see whether there are other types of follow up activities that might be helpful. Um, and impactful for the work that you all are doing. And so again, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting other things. Oh, we will send out the PowerPoint and the recording. So uh, you'll have those resources and I hope that you all go with, um, with my gratitude. Be safe, be healthy, be well. These times are hard, um, but we are clearly bringing around the type of world that we all want to and deserve to live in, right? And that, that's the hope. Um, that's the real work that's happening. So thank you. See you all soon. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye, Palake. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. So wonderful.